While Dr. Pack is making his way up, I'm going to go ahead and, and do the brief intro of um, our uh, next set of panelists. Uh, Jim Casey has dedicated his career, uh, uh, if I didn't say it earlier, he's the director of Baver Health Services, Tennessee Department of Corrections. Got to meet him just uh, this week and uh, very, very impressed with you, sir, and, uh, and look forward to working with you. Uh, but he's dedicated his career to practicing um, the development of developing tools for intervention techniques to treat mental illness, behavioral health issues, and emotional distress. He's a specialized in treatment of behavioral issues and emotional distress. He's specialized in the treatment of substance use disorders, both as a clinician and administrator, and he's served as a substance abuse expert for federal criminal cases, a member of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and served as a substance use expert for multiple multiple advocacy groups for impaired professionals. During his two years of service with the Tennessee Department of Corrections as the statewide director of behavioral health services, Dr. Casey has dedicated extensive time and effort to addressing the growing crisis of opioid addiction. He has taken aggressive action in order to combat this crisis and has worked at building uncompromising cognitive behavioral health programs as well as contributing to the Men's Rehabilitation Center at West Tennessee State Penitentiary. Um, and an entire prison dedicated to the treatment of opioid addiction. Additionally, uh, Dr. Casey uh, currently directs all clinical services for six day reporting center centers across the state, which offer alternatives to um, incarceration featuring three-phase treatment regimen for people with moderate to severe substance use issues. And um, next up, uh, we um, have um, Darren B. DeArmond, Assistant uh, Special Agent with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Special Agent uh, DeArmond is a uh, assistant special agent in charge with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and he currently supervises multiple ongoing PBI drug investigations within the 13 county of East Tennessee, including Knox County. He's a 27-year law enforcement veteran who began his career with the Knoxville Police Department in 92. During his 21 years with the TBI, he's worked in several roles, including the assignment to task forces with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. During his career, DeArmond has conducted multiple federal drug investigations centered on the distribution of cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, methamphetamine in East Tennessee. He's also conducted multiple high-profile public corruption investigations in East Tennessee. Uh, Commissioner Long, prior to being appointed commissioner to the Department of Safety and Homeland Security, was elected sheriff of Williamson County. Uh, in August of 2008, he served at, in the criminal justice field for the past 44 years as an assistant district attorney for the 21st Judicial District, special agent in charge with the TBI, investigator for the 21st Judicial District, arson investigator with the Tennessee Fire Marshal's Office, and captain with the Williamson County Sheriff's Office and federal hospital police officer within <clears throat> the Veterans Administration Hospital in Memphis. And uh, Commissioner Nichols uh, was appointed by Department of Children's Services, was appointed by our Governor Bill Lee um, as commissioner in January of 2019. And prior to joining the DCS, uh, Nichols served as an Assistant District Attorney General in the Shelby County District Attorney General's office for over 20 years. During her tenure at the DA's office, she was Deputy District Director, or Attorney rather, or First Assistant to the District Attorney General where she supervised the day-to-day -day operations of the office and its employees. Before being named as uh, deputy, she served as the chief prosecutor over the Special Victims Unit. There she supervised and handled child homicides, physical abuse, child sexual abuse, elder abuse, and other special projects, while also working closely with the Department of Children's Services as a law enforcement, <clears throat> as well as law enforcement. Uh, and um, so my uh, favorite, uh, one of my favorite human beings in all the world, our Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, <laughs> Jeff Bivens uh, uh, was appointed by uh, former Governor Bill Haslam to the Tennessee Supreme Court in July of 2014. He was elected uh, to the remainder of the full term in August of 2016, and shortly thereafter, his colleagues elected him to the position of Chief Justice. Previously, Justice Bivens was a judge on the Tennessee Court of Criminal Appeals and also served as a circuit court judge for the 21st Judicial District of Tennessee, covering Williamson, Hickman, Lewis, and Perry counties. Prior to his appointment to the trial bench, Justice Bivens practiced law with the firm of Bolt, Cummings, Connors, and Berry in Nashville, and he has served as Assistant Commissioner and General Counsel for the Tennessee Department of Personnel. He's a graduate of Vanderbilt University School of Law, and 
he earned his bachelor's degree from one of our hosts today, East Tennessee State University. Uh, so please welcome our panel and Dr. Pack. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Judge, uh, for pitching in and uh, filling in for me there. I was downstairs doing a podcast and uh, and had to run out and, and uh, rush up back up here to to moderate. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you um, today and to moderate the panel. I'm, I'm, I think uh, we're back on track in terms of time. Amazing how that happens. So that's fantastic. Uh, uh, we have um, five great experts here, and we're going to uh, turn it over to them for uh, eight minutes apiece. And uh, <coughs> If you will, glance over here every now and then, and I'll give you the number like you got left, okay? <laughs> that would be, be helpful. Uh, just, and I'll be watching the time. Um, the order, um, uh, Jim, you going first? Sure. Jim Casey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm from uh, TDOC. I'm the director of Behavioral Health Services. Uh, so in terms of uh, how we're, our efforts to address the opioid addiction issue, uh, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we do uh, in TDOC. Uh, currently, our census is about 21,700 individuals uh, that are in our prison system. Uh, of the people that enter the prison system, uh, 55, 55 to 60 percent of the men identify themselves with a self-identify themselves with a substance use disorder, and then we have another 65 to 70 percent of the women identify themselves as having a substance use disorder. Now we know that's an underrepresentation because it's a self-report. Uh, we, ex we suspect and estimate that the actual amount of individuals that are in our system with a substance use disorder is approximately about 75%. So to tell a little bit how we address substance use issues as a, as a whole, uh, we have 11 TCs, our therapeutic communities, which is our inpatient residential substance use programs uh, across the state and, and our prisons. We have 17 outpatient uh, programs, and we have aftercare in all of our facilities. Um, how have we address the opioid addiction issue? So we, in, in response to the Tennessee to, Together initiative, TDOC developed the Men's Rehabilitative Center. And what the Men's Rehabilitative Center is, um, and we call it the MRC, is um, uh, it's a new era that we brought in of how we're gonna treat individuals with opioid use disorders within the criminal justice system. Um, and what this is, is it's a 512 bed unit uh, dedicated to really just substance use, and it provides the full continuum of care. Uh, when I say the full continuum of care, that means that we have a therapeutic community or inpatient treatment, we have intensive outpatient, we have outpatient, and we have uh, intervention. Uh, and just a little bit more, I wanna come back so I, you can understand the time frames. So our therapy community are the ones that are really gonna get those individuals that have the moderate to severe issues. Uh, what we do here is that program is nine to 12 months in length, in duration. Uh, so, and we, when we started the MRC, we started back in April of 2018. Uh, since then, we, that therapeutic community or that residential treatment has graduated over 102 individuals. Uh, we also have uh, additional recovery services at the MRC. Uh, that's going to include uh, aftercare, family reunification, and recovery peer support. And now I'm going to talk about some of the pinnacle features of those programs. Uh, one of them is going to be the certified peer recovery specialist. Uh, which is peers providing uh, peer help and assistance to other individuals either during, before, or after treatment. Uh, and it's a partnership that we did with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Uh, and since we started this, uh, these individuals uh, are at eight facilities. We have 53 individuals that have been trained. We have 26 that have been certified. Uh, it's a transferable skill because these individuals can get certified. They can have those jobs within inside the prison. They can help their peers, and that peer-to-peer -peer help is very powerful, as we all know. Uh, and then these individuals, it's a transferable skill because it will go out into the community with them as well. Uh, and I believe that that's something that we can enhance, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, the other thing, another pinnacle area is going to be the recovery units. So what we have done over this last six to seven months is we've developed recovery units, and exactly what it sounds like. It's a housing unit. Uh, for individuals that have completed treatment, people that are committed to recovery, uh, where they can have an environment where it's as safe as possible or people are working towards the same goal of recovery. Uh, and we currently have those at Morgan County Correctional Complex or Bledsoe County Correctional Complex. In terms of community supervision, um, and this is for individuals, uh, returning citizens, what we like to call them, 
uh, are people that are on probation and parole. Uh, and what we do here is I'm gonna talk about the forensic social workers. And forensic social workers uh, provide a continuum of care uh, for individuals with substance use as well as mental health issues. We have 37 FSWs, or forensic social workers, that cover all 95 counties across the state. Uh, and what happens is FSW will receive a referral uh, for an individual that has been suspected of uh, either a positive drug screen, suspected of use, reported use, or they're coming up uh, on our risk needs assessment, they're coming up as having a need. So they'll get that referral to the FSW. The forensic social worker will then assess the individual and de determine what do they need, what's the most appropriate referral to make for this person. And they have a choice to either send them to the uh, community provider, send them to the DRC or the day reporting center, uh, also send them to uh, treatment using the uh, Community Treatment Collaborative, which again is another interagency partnership with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use Services. Uh, and just to put it in the, into context, um, last year, last fiscal year, uh, we had 15,839 referrals to the FSWs. Of that 15,000, 15, uh, 7,400 uh, had a substance use issue. And then an additional 3,900 had a co-occurring issue. So you're looking at over 11,000 individuals were referred to the FSWs that had some form of substance use issue, uh, which speaks to uh, what we're doing there. So uh, we're uh, a very good program, and, and again, 15,800 uh, is, is, a, is a huge number. Um, and the people that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Community uh, Treatment Collaborative, which is another one of the sources that they have, that our FSWs have in order to give individuals treatment. Uh, the CTC, or the Community Treatment Collaborative, is the interagency agreement between the mental health and substance use services. Uh, and what it does is there's 57 providers um, that are approved that can provide a wide range of treatment. That treatment consists of detox services, in, intensive outpatient, cross hospitalization, and uh, inpatient, and sober living programs. Uh, we, in the fiscal year, uh, the most recent fiscal year, we had 1,744 individuals that were treated using that. And of that, uh, through the first three quarters of that, that number, that 1,700 number, 27% uh, had an opioid uh, use disorder, had, had an opioid issue. Uh, we also have the day reporting centers, and the day reporting centers uh, are six uh, facilities that we, the TDOC developed across the state that provides uh, a one-year, uh, three-phase program for individuals that have substance use issues and or uh, mental health issues. And it's based on the intensive outpatient model. Uh, once they complete that program, they will, uh, again, go to um, aftercare, and they'll be in aftercare up to a year, but they can stay in these programs uh, ongoing. Uh, so, and I know I'm kind of, we're out of time, I just need a little bit more, so uh, I wanna make sure I get all this in here, and I'm talking as fast as I can, but it's important stuff, and I want everybody to hear it. Um, so we have, like I said, we have six locations. Currently, we have 250 people that are enrolled, and we have another 39 that are in aftercare. The capacity is 300. Uh, and what we would like to pursue coming up is one, we wanna continue to develop, establish a recovery support system for individuals inside the prisons as well as when they get out in the community. Uh, we would like to have, add additional drug and alcohol counselors to the community so we can help get those assessments. So we can have one, uh, two in each uh, region or two at each, uh, or one at each uh, DRC. Uh, we wanna expand and maximize the peer recovery specialist uh, so we can use these individuals in the community and more in, in across the prison setting. Uh, we want to work in, with collab collaboratively with uh, community agencies, uh, such as Department of Mental Health, uh, to maximize our resources, get everybody out together on the same page, um, and really uh, get some wraparound services so we can cover the person from the time before they get in, while they're in, and once they get out, to keep them from coming back and get the help they need. Uh, we want to expand aftercare as a formalized form of treatment, um, and then we want the opportunities to expand and uh, service capacity to meet the needs of the population. And what that's gonna look like is, I know we're in East Tennessee, uh, we already have one of our DRCs that's over capacity. And there's a great need in, in, in East Tennessee to have some more of these uh, locations, uh, in at least two counties that I know of uh, that we would need it out there. And Judge can speak to that a little bit more. He's like, yes, build them. Uh, so uh, that's what we like to do. And of course, we wanna expand the FSWs, our forensic social workers, because our forensic social workers are getting that, almost 16,000 referrals. Uh, so we can really maximize cap capturing everybody and getting them going. Some of the barriers that we have are just keeping pace with the number of individuals that are coming into the system with a substance use issue. Uh, we want also, there's re financial resources uh, to support staff to meet the needs of the program to provide the treatment. Uh, also, better identifying uh, individuals with opioid substance use. 
to provide alternatives before they hit the prison. Because um, I dare somebody to go out in, in, in the state of Tennessee and find a, a, a unit or a service that has 512 beds that treats individuals with substance use disorders. I, I dare you somebody to tell me. I'd love to see it. Uh, and then uh, that with those front-end alternatives, and we're working on something right now with uh, one of the governor's initiatives uh, to try to help. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that better? And I don't believe that these are obstacles. I believe that these um, are just challenges. And I think these are challenges that we can overcome if we all work together. I think uh, Governor Lee and his team is very aggressive in pursuing how we're gonna do this. Where we have, like I said, we have task force, we have initiatives, we have technical assistance that are ongoing right now. I mean, every week, I'm in at least two meetings that's something to do with this. So I believe that everybody in this room is part of that, that team that we're gonna overcome these issues or your agencies you represent. So um, we have to do this as a team in order to, to address the opioid issues. So that's all I've got. Sorry I went over and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you did great. Thank you very much. <laughs> next, uh, Jennifer, are you next, I think, on the, on the list? It says so right here. I'm just going to get on the <laughs> get on the list here. Jennifer Nichols, uh, so whether Commissioner. I was, whether I was supposed to be next or not, I'm next. Um, so good afternoon, you all. Um, we were introduced briefly, but I'm looking around. I know a few people in here, but not a lot. I'm um, Jennifer Nichols, and um, as you guys heard, was appointed in January to serve as commissioner of, of the Department of Children's Services. What a big job. What a big task. Um, as of this morning, we have 9,134 children in DCS custody. And so you, you say that number, and it's the number that stands out but what I would ask you all to remember is there's a face behind every num number. 9,134 children that should be, you know, if things were as they should be, at home with their parents, grandparents, other caregivers. And instead, they're in our custody. Of those children, 8,265 are in foster care. Um, 869 came to us through the juvenile justice system. And the reason why those numbers are important is don't we all know in this room that many, many, many of them are in our custody because of what? That's right. Um, they are with us because their, their family, their care caregivers um, have addiction issues. And so even though the children, these little kids that are, you know, newborns to 18, may not have addiction issues of their own, they're not able to go home because of that. And because of that, DCS has taken an approach um, that I'm proud of, and that's to try and address some of these issues at home. Um, there's two, two projects, really, that I'd like to talk to you briefly about that or two, I don't know, efforts that we have that to attempt to address the issue, and, and it's Safe Baby Courts and it's our DCS drug teams. I'll talk to you about the DCS drug teams first. Um, in 2017, one department within DCS formed the first drug team. And it was an effort to improve the investigation and, just, and the services available for drug-affected infants um, born or treated at UT Children's Hospital right here in, in Knoxville. You know, the team currently consists of 21 people that serve Knox, the East Tennessee, and our and Smoky Mountain region um, in East Tennessee. Just to give you a little, I guess, uh, overhead of what they're dealing with. So from January to June of this year, those 21 people handled 758 referrals. Now, a referral, of course, is... is you know, when we have learned that a child zero to three months is drug addicted or drug exposed and needs help. And so those cases are investigated. They're, they're more difficult investigations than some. They last longer than some. Uh, we try and have the investigation portion done within 60 days, and then it's transferred to um, or put services in the home where we can, and when we can't, the children are removed. A t of the 758 referrals, 135 of those babies, 
came into DCS custody in the last six months, just in this area. Now, there were more children that were put, taken away from the parents. They were just simply given to, like, in, in fact, I think it's 30 or 40 percent of the 758 were removed. But those children were given to or placed with family members. Those 135 didn't have an appropriate family member and are actually in our custody. Um, the drug teams, I guess, originally in 2017, when the first one was formed in 2018, um, sort of the department was restructured and the teams were expanded, and that's how we got to the 21 individuals. And they, um, we know that we need additional teams, you know, in terms of what we're working on, and, and I'm sort of jumping the gun on the questions, we want to expand that across the state. Um, it, it's had a very positive result here. We all know that to, to get these families back together or to make sure these children are safe in the future, um, right now, uh, this endeavor is one that is actually working and it's pretty easy to measure and, and see whether or not you're successful with the services in the home. Because if you're successful, you're going to see a change in the family, change in the parents, and, and the children will be able to be reunited. If not, then other steps will be taken. Um, in terms of the second program that we're working on, um, Safe Baby Courts, in 2015, I believe, uh, was, was a pilot program in Davidson County with a Safe Baby Court. And the I can tell you that... Department of Children's Services, the Administrative Office of the Courts, the AOC, as well as the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse are working closely with one another. Though it started as a small pilot in 2015, um, in 2017, the General Assembly um, passed legislation which created uh, these courts that are, they call them zero to three courts. It's not zero to three months, it's zero to three years. If a child um, qualifies, a child under the age zero to three years old qualifies, um, they are brought into the program, but fortunately, any siblings that they have and their parents are also brought into the program. So it allows uh, our three departments to provide wraparound services for those families in hopes of um, turning the families around and. Um, getting the parents off drugs, putting the children back with the parents if they've been removed, and if, they, if it's impossible, put it back together, then to figure out what's the best for the child. Now, I'll say in 2018, um, excuse me, in 2019, additional legislation has been passed. We had seven, seven in Stewart, Madison, Davidson, Grundy, Coffee, Johnson, what am I missing? Did I say Knox? Anyway, and so now we've got new, new legislation as of this year that creates, that gives us, three departments, the ability to create five more safe baby courts. Currently, we are the only state across the country poised with the desire to take this across the state, to put one in every county. Um, we are in the midst of, you know, getting a contract signed with the various uh, entities, but it is our hope to have the next five up and running before the end of the year. Um, it's not an easy task, but again, uh, based on what we've heard and based on my uh, anecdotally, you know, I've been privy and, and allowed to go to the first graduation um, and it was two, it, it was two families affected. And what a, what a great day that was to see families on the brink of being torn apart. And yet uh, that judge, that magistrate, that court staff, um, substance abuse, um, and now they're together. And we got to see them up there with the judge getting a pat on the back. And it was, it, and there's been graduation since then. So, um, we are looking for all the support we can get with respect to the safe baby courts. Um, 
we were asked to talk about our efforts that we things that we would like to pursue mine's real short and I probably won't need my eight minutes because I got one minute left we want to pursue those two efforts we want to expand our drug courts we want to expand our safe baby courts and be able to come back and stand in front of you and show you the difference that each of those projects has made uh, and I appreciate your time and thanks for letting me be here Thank you, Commissioner Nichols and uh, Commissioner Long. Good afternoon, and uh, President Boyd, thank you for organizing what an important topic, an important summit, and thank you for the invitation to come and represent the state of Tennessee. We were asked to talk about a little bit about our efforts to address, to address the epidemic, and I guess I start with what Governor Lee has done starting this year. Uh, he put $35 million in the budget to start addressing the problem, dealing with the opioid epidemic, uh, and trying to get that to the opportunities that need to have an effect on all of us. You know, you've heard the statistics, and I'm going to go a little bit different probably from most of the presenters. I'm going to look at it sort of from a law enforcement function. So you've heard the numbers. You know what the effect is on drug addicts. You know what the numbers is on drug-related crimes and you know what the numbers are on other crimes that are related to drug dependency. And that's what's got us into the situation that we're into today. Uh, back in 2018, Dr. Lloyd, you may have part to do with this, uh, Tennessee Together was unveiled uh, by Governor Haslam, which updated the scheduling of controlled substances to better track them, better monitor of them, better penalize the use of them, and uh, the unlawful distribution of it. Uh, Governor Lee has carried that a little bit further by reclassifying fentanyl in the first session of his legislation, uh, which is very, very important to us in law enforcement. Our biggest threat, honestly, is fentanyl for the overdose of our officers. So uh, we naturally are concerned about that. Uh, another way that we try to address it through the Department of Safety is working with our counterparts, the TBI our other federal, state, and local partners and trying to stop the flow of drugs across the state of Tennessee. Uh, just real quick, I know you've heard a lot of numbers, but I, I, I wanna throw these to you uh, on particular what we have to look at. In 2013, the uh, number of uh, uh, drug-related or drug overdose deaths was 1166. In 2017, uh, it went up to 1776, a drastic climb. Also, the opioid-related deaths went from 754 to 1268. Now, take the rise in the overdose uh, deaths that you've got. We have to look at that, trying to keep you safe on the highway. And what does that mean? That means we have more drug-impaired drivers driving the state of Tennessee than we ever have before. Our fatal crashes have gone up from 963 to 1024. So we're seeing the, the increase with the drug addiction in the number of traffic deaths and fatalities that we're having across the state. Also, as you know, uh, the law enforcement has begun, uh, every agency pretty well in the state of Tennessee now has Narcan uh, to save the individuals that we run up on that are overdosing and try to save their life, but also save the lives of our officers and our canines. Uh, you know, we even have canines now who are overdosing because of the sniff of fentanyl or some of the other drugs. So we're having to inject the canines actually to save those. Um, we have a program in the Tennessee Highway Patrol called the, the Interstate or Interdiction Plus Team. These are troopers that are assigned to the eight districts of Tennessee who do the illegal flow of narcotics across the state. That's all they do is watch for those out on the interstate. Also, they're looking past just the regular traffic stop. Once they get the stop of any individual, they're looking past just writing a citation. They're looking for the other exhibitors that would indicate the flow of drugs. And uh, uh, I, I want to tell you, they are doing a tremendous job that they are intercepting large quantities of narcotics going across our state that unfortunately we're not able to publicize to you because those investigations are ongoing. So it's hard to publicize those when we're still trying to further that investigation. I do want to remind you, one of the main problems we have in Tennessee for the highway patrol is the interstate highway system. 
We are a traffic hub for narcotics going across this nation. Uh, I-40, I-65, I-81, I-75, all the others. We're just like Interstate 10 is in Florida. It travels every day across the state. And the amount that we seize, it really scares you to know how much we're getting, to know how much we're not getting. That's the big fear that we have uh, trying to do that. Also, what we're having problems now, you know, we're used to arresting drunk drivers. And we would catch those drunk drivers in the afternoon and evening after they'd been socializing, drinking, uh, going to beer joints, things like that, and watch for them on the highway. The total concept of law enforcement has now had to change. We're having to do drug recognition rather than DUI detention. And what does that require? That requires an officer to be DRE certified, which is very, very difficult and very, very expensive to do. And the task that you give, you know, we're all used to the bloodshot eyes, the slurred speech, uh, the red face, uh, the, uh, the um, slurred speech, things like that. Now the officers in, in every agency in Tennessee is having to look at those other indicators to make sure that we're looking at the drug aspect, not just the alcohol aspect. What would we like to pursue to try to help us? Naturally, we'd like to increase the number of interstate and interdiction plus troopers and working with our state, federal, and local partners, increase those numbers and try to make larger interceptions of those narcotics that are coming across the country. Also, we are making a conscious effort to increase the number of drug recognition experts just in the highway patrol. We did not have many initially, and we have increased, I think, 60 or 70 in the last few days, and we're gonna to try to get to where most of the state troopers across this state, if not all of them, are drug recognition experts, so they will know how to do that. And also, in all honesty, be able to present that case in court and be able to, to uh, carry that burden that's needing to make that conviction. It doesn't do us any good to carry the individual to court if we can't prove the case. So we've got to be better, we've got to be better trained in order to do that. One thing that we don't do well, and we've got to do that, is TBI and the Department of Safety have a uh, place at the TBI Center in Nashville called the Fusion Center. That is an intelligence sharing center, if you don't know about it, for law enforcement statewide. I don't think we do a good job yet on collecting the data of narcotics, the uh, interdictions, the arrest, and things to share out to the street officers on the street and everybody else across our state. And that's one of the things that Director Roush and I have committed to, is to try to increase that effort, make sure we're getting that intelligence information out to our law enforcement officers. Also, we're gonna to have to increase the number of Narcan uh, that's issued. Uh, as you heard a few minutes ago, I was a sheriff of a county uh, before I was selected by Governor Lee to be the commissioner. Uh, I can tell you we were injecting the same individual four and five times. Uh, they would overdose, we would get them back, carry them to the hospital three days later. They thought we could save them again and they'd be doing it again. And so the replenish of Narcan, uh, eventually we have to look at what we're going to do about expanding that. Uh, training, as I said, for our law enforcement partners on drug impaired driving. And we do that through one of the divisions of our office called the Tennessee Highway Safety Office. Uh, they're the ones that do the training for law enforcement, and we're going to increase the number of ca uh, classes that we have. And then we're proud to tell you, too, that through the Tennessee Highway Safety Office, uh, we were able to give $300,000 to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse for uh, funding for treatment and for drug courts. And that's a grant we gave them this year, and we're proud of that contribution that we were able to make to do that. Our barriers to our success, as I've said, the interstate highway system. That is a barrier that we have to fight and we have to face. And not only that, but the safety of the officer that's stopping the individual. As most of you know, you wouldn't want to get out on the side of the interstate uh, day or night because of the traffic coming by. That is a hindrance to us and we have to work on that. I've talked about the alcohol versus drugs and the driving impaired uh, thing. And then, you know, we have to deal also with the opioids that are prescribed, but we also have to deal with the manufactured fake opioids that are across this state, which is large in number. So it's difficult sometimes for law enforcement uh, to be able to make criminal cases because of the prescriptions. The individual may have a prescription for the opioid, 
but is he abusing the prescription? That's what we have to look at and, and try to go further. And like say, the illegally processed that they manufacture, we have to look at those. And then as I said, the biggest barrier we have, I think in all law enforcement has right now, is fentanyl. It is so dangerous and we worry about our, our, our uh, officers every day uh, not to overdose on those. Again, President Boyd, thank you. Appreciate the invitation to the summit and look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Thank you very much. Uh, Agent, uh, Agent Darman? D. Arman. D. Arman. Afternoon. I'm not David Roush. I don't do this very often. So if you. Thank goodness there's a podium here that you can't see my knees knocking, okay? Um, the one thing I didn't want to dispute was I came on with the police department a year before he did, and uh, the statement he made this morning about making thousands of arrests, um, I may need to see him about that. <laughs> so, um, when he asked me to come speak uh, and represent him, um, I said, what am I going to say, Director? I said, I'm just a, a drug agent out here working drug cases all the time. And uh, he said, tell them what they don't know. Tell them what you do every day. Tell them what your agents are doing. So that's what I'm gonna do. I don't have a lot of stats. That's Tommy Farmer's game. He does all that. I'm just gonna talk to you, okay? Uh, that's about all I know how to do. So currently, I am the assistant special agent charge uh, in the Knoxville uh, region. That is Knox County and the 12 surrounding counties uh, that kind of touch Knox County. Um, I have seven agents covering 13 counties. If that gives you an idea of what we're facing. Um, those agents uh, are signed as I have a diversion agent. I have a couple of agents who are signed to various task forces um, in the area uh, with, with the FBI. And um, you know we're limited there, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, what is our focus? What do we do? What do I do? What do I oversee? Uh, we focus mainly on the obviously the law enforcement side of things. Um, we target the mid to upper level uh, drug conspiracies, the DTO, the drug trafficking organizations who are in this area or trying to bring drugs into this area. Uh, we work a lot with uh, Commissioner Long folks and the troopers and the FBI and DEA, um, you know, Knoxville Police Department, Knox County Sheriff's Department, whatever uh, venue or, or jurisdiction we're in, our role is to kind of come in and, and provide resources to help those agencies with problems that they may have in their communities. Um, just recently, we had an agent uh, signed to the uh, Drug Related Death Task Force here in Knoxville uh, that's headed up by Knoxville PD and uh, Sergeant Schaefer's group over there. Um, very eye-opening, very eye-opening for our agents. Uh, that agent not only works full-time on that task force, but he's responsible for also responding to overdose deaths uh, in outlying counties. Um, and um, to me, it's been an eye-opening experience because as being the supervisor, I get the reports that come through the Dangerous Drugs Task Force. I get the reports from Knoxville Police Department. I get the reports from other agencies that come on, on the overdose deaths. And um, it's staggering. It really is. Um, the other day I sat down for lunch and was looking at the paper someone left laying there and there was an obituary there of a 21 year old man and um, I had just entered him into the overdose database about 30 minutes before that and um, it, it hits you I've got four kids four boys from 19 to 24 and uh, if you don't think that can't be one of your kids um, the old adage you're smoking crack because it can be, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate from anybody. Any walk of life can fall into this trap. Um, so we're doing our best to fight it. Um, my responsibility is to see that we use every tool at our uh, disposal to, to fight this epidemic. Um, I have agents out right now as we speak buying heroin here in Knoxville, getting text while I'm sitting up here. Um, we work night and day, uh, we're tired, we're understaffed, but we're going to keep doing the fight because we have to, somebody's got to, and Commissioner Long, I think will echo this, somebody's got to do it. 
We can't just stop. I understand it's, it's a team effort between prevention and health and, and law enforcement, um, corrections, judicial. Um, but um, what happens if we just get tired and stop? You see what goes on in McAllen, Texas? What goes on down around the border of Arizona? If you don't think that cartels are here, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. We're working cases right now directly tied to Mexico right here in your backyard. Directly tied, not through New York or Atlanta or, or somewhere directly tied. And all they're doing is, is, is he said, bringing fentanyl in here. It's killing our kids. It's killing people's family members. That, that's all there's to it. It's just death. I watched a video, uh, I think it was Philadelphia, and a uh, commander up there, they were interviewing him about fentanyl. And um, he, he said fentanyl was the, 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 one of the horses of the apocalypse, and they called him death. That's how they he characterized it. And I thought that was pretty accurate from what we're seeing. Um, as I've said, or as it's been said often today, I'm sorry I didn't get these, though. I came a supervisor. Um, <laughs> we can't do this by ourselves, as I just said. We can't arrest this problem away. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, I don't care how many times you arrest them. It, they're going to get back out on the street, uh, and, and the cycle just continues. We can't do it. It's, it's got to be a total partnership between everybody in this room to get this done. Uh, efforts we'd like to pursue, and we're starting to, to do this, um, the legislature and also through the pro program called uh, Appalachia HIDA, which is High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. It's a federal program, allows the feds and the and state partners and local partners um, to, to come together to, to fight this crime. Uh, what we're trying to do is, and, and I know we've, we spoke a lot about the metropolitan areas, but some of the outer areas where we're seeing overdoses, they don't have the means and the ability to, to track and follow and investigate this type of crime. And what we're trying to do is stand up many task forces in those areas. Uh, we're, we're bringing officers from agencies in, deputize them as TBI agents, giving them our resources. And when they have an overdose death in their community, they can call our agents, come out, work alongside them, uh, try to combat this. It, it's, it's different because uh, in 27 years I've been doing this, you know, you have a crime and you investigate it. Um, overdose deaths are a little different because you have a death, and you gotta go backwards to figure out where that came from. Who, who sold that poison to them? Um, so it, it's a little different, but, but it's something that we're willing to accept that challenge and try to tie a criminal act to a death. Um, I know in Knox County, um, they've been charging folks with second degree murder uh, if you can tie someone to a death, I think other jurisdictions are starting to do that. Um, the federal system, it's a minimum mandatory 20-year sentence if you can uh, convict someone of a death in federal court uh, related to fentanyl or heroin or a drug of that matter. Um, I have a, one minute. Barriers to success. Um, I'm just going to be honest with you. I need more people. Um, that, that's our barrier. Uh, I, I, you know, every day almost, you know, my admin brings me complaints about drug activity, and I don't have anybody to give it to because my agents are covered up or they're out working night and day uh, or they're sitting on wiretaps for days on end, 24 hours a day. And, you know, we just recently got 10 drug agents for across the state, um, but be honest with you, we could use about 40 or 50 more very easily. Uh, and I understand the budgets, you know, it's tough, but um, that's our biggest barrier is I don't have the people to do the work that needs to be done. Um, we're, we're, we're doing our dangest, I assure you, but it's just, it's just not enough. Um, and that's way above my pay scale, but um, that's the biggest barrier I see to what we're doing is just the, the boots on the ground uh, to, to fight this battle. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Agent Giorno. Thank you so much. Uh, great comments. Uh, Chief Justice? Thank you very much. I want to, on behalf of the judiciary, I do want to echo, as Commissioner Long talked about, President Boyd, thank you so much for hosting here today. President Nolan, I know, had to leave earlier, but he, we both, we appreciate so much the two of you working together to put this together and bring so many people here today on this important topic. Uh, as I stand here today and as I heard Commissioner Long, I couldn't help but think back more years than I, th I think we want to remember now. Uh, I was a trial court judge and Commissioner Long was an assistant district attorney and he was trying drug cases in front of me then as a judge. I think we were a little less complicated at that point, That's Commissioner, don't you? Things have come a long way from those days in Lewis and Perry County when we did that and it's not a good way either. We have now come to see that this epidemic is nothing, there is nothing ordinary about it in Tennessee. But we, I am proud of what the judiciary and what is we as a state are doing together to attempt to address this issue. I came directly over here to this conference yesterday from a meeting in Asheville, North Carolina, in which Chief Justices from across the country got together, as we do twice a year, to discuss important topics. One of the primary issues we discussed was the opioid epidemic. Well, over the past year, or over a year, we've had a national opioid task force put together, which was indeed co-chaired by our own Debbie Tate, the AOC director of the national task force, along with Chief Justice Loretta Rush from Indiana. They presented findings at that conference, and you'll hear more from Debbie tomorrow on that, but it is yeoman's work and yeoman's resources for everyone to use, and I'm very proud of, of that effort. I also recall back in 2018, where someone mentioned the Tennessee Together program. In 2018, I stood on a podium with then Governor Haslam, Lieutenant Governor McNally, Speaker Harwell, and I stood together in a joint press conference. The first time anyone can remember when the leaders of all three branches of government stood together to talk about the opioid epidemic and to pledge cooperation between all the branches of government to address those issues. We also have, as, as has been mentioned to some extent, the Regional Joint Opioid Initiative. And Judge Sloan, Judge Tim Brock is here, Debbie Tate and I, just a few weeks ago were in Detroit talking with the other seven states about the second anniversary of that and how we can continue to cooperate in a unique compact that's never been seen before in our country. Uh, all, but. It's with regard to Tennessee, we have to recognize that of course there's an impact on our criminal court system because of the addiction related crimes. But what we also have to remember is the increased stress on our juvenile courts in handling the influx of children needing foster care that Commissioner Nichols talked about. We have the chancery courts having to manage guardianships for impacted adults and the myriad of financial and family law problems that our civil courts have to face. As you know, our state has been one of the hardest hit in the country, but out of this tragedy has risen the opportunity for us to have these new partnerships and the innovation which we're seeing, which is exactly what this conference is about. We are working together and that is the only way out of this crisis. No one agency or court can arrest educate, treat, sentence, or incarcerate its way out of this crisis. We must collaborate and we must put aside any turf issues. We must come together if we're to make any significant progress. From the standpoint of the judiciary, the judges across our state have received and will continue to receive significant training, specifically about opioid use disorder, and its treatment and recovery options. Today, the court system stands second only to self-referrals and substance abuse treatment referrals. We have learned that involvement with the justice system is an invaluable opportunity to guide or order, as the case may be, those in need to the treat for the treatment, resources, and services 
that can be life-changing. While the 78 treatment courts across the state are busy, judges are also innovating by implementing uh, pr pr procedures and programs such as the recovery-oriented compliance strategy, 10 Rocks, that Judge Sloan will be telling you more about later. They're utilizing the, report, the daycare reporting centers set up by TDOC, developing recovery housing options, and working with various agencies or programs aimed at reducing the number of neonatal abstinence syndrome babies born in our state. The Regional Joint Opioid Initiative has become a model across the country, as well as has been the Tennessee Judicial Opioid Initiative. We're proud to be seen as leaders in this country to help facilitate cross-state and cross-branch and cross-agency collaboration that leads to results. Through these efforts, we, ha we have a chance to, to succeed in this effort, but it is a joint effort that we must continue and be diligent upon. Unfortunately, one of the lessons we have learned throughout this process is that what was defined simply as an opioid epidemic is, as this summit has pointed out, truly an addiction and suicide crisis. No less than three times over the past year, I've had to go personally to visitations of folks that I know that have, that have loved ones who have died as a result of, at least in some extent, of an overdose of drugs. When attending one of those, I was speaking with the woman who was the director, the owner of the funeral home, and she said, Jeff, what you don't realize is that we average two people per year, or per, per week of deaths that we have in this funeral home alone as a result of this. Many of the approaches and the partnerships that we create together are the only way we're gonna bring that number down. I stand before you here today to say the courts are committed to addressing those issues, to um, being ready to uh, modify any approaches we take, and we're continuing to modernize and ensure we continue to make process progress in this effort. I wanna close simply by returning to say uh, to the thank you to President Boyd and to President Nolan. What a great example of putting aside those silos and bringing people together in what could be a competitive atmosphere, but because of innovative and strong leaders like President Boyd and President Nolan, we stand together here today to address these issues. And thank you again for doing that, uh, President Boyd. And for those reasons, that's the prime example of what we are doing here today, what we need to do in the future, and what we have to remain committed to as well. I thank you, appreciate the time. Justice, that was uh, fantastic, succinct, and right on time. <laughs> he, he, he uh, I mean, nailed it. Uh, so we have time for, we have about 10 minutes actually for questions and I'm hopeful that we can get some good discussion going. Um, I, we have one over here starting, Dr. Brooks. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Bill Brooks with ETSU. I want to thank you all for being here. It's rare that um, folks in my field, public health research, get a chance to sit in front of law enforcement and corrections. It's a real uh, missing value for us. Um, I have three questions. I'm going to try to remember them all. Um, one, I'm wondering if we have any good evidence in Tennessee around uh, the risk of overdose from transdermal contact with fentanyl for law enforcement. I know there's some disagreement. I think uh, we lack toxicological evidence around that, so I just wonder if there's anything going on around that, because I think it would be worth, you know, if there's a debate, getting past that, um, if there is a significant risk. Um, Second, uh, the, the, you mentioned the cartels. Um, we talked to folks about, um, I'm up in Northeast Tennessee, so we, I try to get out and talk to people, and um, we hear that uh, shake and bake meth is the most common uh, way folks are uh, getting their meth, but um, you, know, you hear word of cartel, people having contacts with the cartel. So I just wondered if there was sort of a general uh, consensus on you know sort of what the majority of meth is looking like in the state um, and then I wondered if there was any thoughts on 
uh, the sort of unintended consequences of homicide in, or uh, overdose-induced homicide, those laws, and folks maybe not wanting to call uh, first, you know, emergency services if, you know, somebody that they may have passed dope onto overdosed and that sort of thing. Um, it just passed in North Carolina where I live, and um, it was heavily opposed by the harm reduction coalition over there. So just any thoughts you have on any of those or whatever you want to talk about. Thanks. So, so three uh, different uh, questions Here. that, that uh, could stimulate a lot of conversations. So, <laughs> uh, who would like to take uh, uh, any of the three questions? If you like, I can try to repeat them. I'll try to address two if I can. And I'm a buccaneer at heart, so. All right. Even though I've got President Boyd, sorry. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I've, got, I've got a tie for you. I'll, I'll, Same as him. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and Tommy Farmer can also attest to this. I, I think the, the, the old-fashioned shake and bake meth, we're seeing less and less of that. Uh, the majority of the meth we see now comes in south of the border. Uh, through through hubs like Atlanta or Dallas or Detroit or, or wherever, you know. Um, I, they're still out there, uh, the shake and bake labs, particularly probably more in the rural communities than the metropolitan areas. But predominantly, uh, the meth we're seeing is Mexican meth. It's coming from the cartels and south of the border. That answered, sorry. I'm sorry. We're seeing fentanyl in just about everything. Uh, probably not as as, uh, as much as we are being cut in heroin, uh, but we are seeing it in meth and cocaine both, uh, or if it's not 100% fentanyl. Well, uh, we've, we've, we've been buying that also, where we think it's heroin, it ends up being 100% fentanyl, uh, which you know, in and of itself is a huge danger to my agents and, and whatever officers, agents, agencies we're working with. Uh, we're actually doing search warrants now and gloves uh, 3M respirators, um, just because of the danger and risk it poses to, to my guys. Commissioner Long, you, you want to speak? Well, to, uh, the problem that I think all law enforcement is facing on the fentanyl in particular is not knowing what right. uh, level it is or what it's laced with or anything. And yes, I know a lot of the drugs that we've seen are being uh, conjoined together with fentanyl. Uh, cocaine or whatever and that's the thing that's having the overdoses is individuals are taking something thinking they're taking one thing not knowing it's laced with fentanyl and then that causes the overdose that's causing them to die um, I would agree with him on the meth I think you know we see the shake and bakes every once in a while but not as often as we used to uh, the biggest thing I've been in this now 46 years I think the biggest thing that I've seen in my whole career was when they put the Sudafed and everything behind the counter. That stopped the meth labs for quite a while. You see them coming back a little bit now. Uh, meth is a number one or two drug again now. Uh, it's resurgent, but as he says, it's coming from other areas. So we're dealing with the meth again. Um, I don't want to be grotesque about it, but I, I mean, I've seen, I've seen, I had a jail that, it was a 454-bed capacity jail, and I've seen the addicts in the jail talking about the transdermal patches and things like that. I've seen them take that and wash it and get the residue out of it to, to uh, digest or get high again. So, yes, transdermal, I mean, even though it's there, they use all of that to get high. So uh, it, it's hard to, to, to have a quantitative amount of it. And... I was an assistant DA for much longer than I've been the Commissioner of Children's Services. And I can say an unintended consequence that we saw in Shelby County with the West Tennessee Drug Task Force is the fact that when these officers would make arrests and have these guys in the car, and um, there were times when afterwards an unintended consequence was having to take that car out of service um, because of, I don't know what you call it, but it's cleaning the car. Contamination. Contam you know, it, it's decontaminating the car, which is very expensive. Um, we've had officers having to inject themselves with Narcan um, for fear, and that's something that nobody ever thought of. I mean, they are simply making arrests and doing what 
and heroes out there on the road, and they end up in danger just from being in contact with these guys. Next question. Or actually, uh, did we answer all your questions, yeah. Dr. Brooks? We'll close, close in on it. <laughs> unintended consequences of the overdose-induced homicide uh, legislation that passed in North Carolina uh, and just passed in Tennessee. Anyone want to speak to that? Good Samaritan law in, in conflict with the uh, overdose-induced uh, homicide uh, law. Yeah, the, so there's some tension there This the, that I think uh, Dr. Brooks just unpacked a little bit. Does anyone want to speak to that issue? As I just said up there earlier, uh, that is one of the goals that, that we're seeing prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, try to put some of these folks who are distributing. My, I'm not talking about their friend who hands, hands them something they use, but the actual distributors who are moving large amounts of this stuff, if we can tie death to them, I'm gonna put them in prison if I can. Um, so, you know, that's our goal, really, on the desk, is to try to tie it back to a, a main distributor, a hub that we can charge that death to. Next question. Yes, I have two questions. One, um, you had discussed about how it has changed when the officers make a stop on the interstate. What are the physical indicators that you can look for now? Because you can't look for the, you know, the stumbling or the red eyes. And the other thing I had a question was on the, when you talk to the funeral directors, have they mentioned anything about the dangers or the unintended consequences that they have as they're preparing the bodies of those that are, have had the uh, overdoses? I can, I'll go address the second one since I brought that up. Honestly, I have not had those conversations. This was literally a conversation I had with her when it was during a visitation. So I haven't had formal conversations with her. I would think, uh, I suspect that they, they are having to take precautions along those lines, but I don't have specific information to answer your question on that. Talking about the funeral home? I'll jump in there if you don't mind, because he uses the same funeral home I do. Uh, <laughs> there are friends of ours that run the funeral home. We, when I was sheriff, we did some training with them, telling them the safeguards of what to watch for uh, on drug-induced uh, bodies, things like that, and tried to prepare them, uh, especially when the fentanyl came out strong, to what to watch for and make sure they didn't ingest it, didn't get it in the air. I mean, they <coughs> even got so, so much with them, we told them, not even turn on the air conditioning in the room because it'll activate the particles in the air. So uh, we did a little bit of training with them when when they uh, when we first started hearing about it. And the second question was related to um, things to watch out for when uh, when you're pulling someone over, in, you know, indicators of uh, intoxication. If anyone wants to speak to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, it's sort of some of the same indicators that DUI has, except you don't have the odor, but you have to look at different pupil dilation than what you do for alcohol. Uh, some of the other uh, things about the speech is not like slurred speech, but it's different. Uh, there are certain things that they teach indicators that you have to, to proficient, become proficient in in order to be certified as a drug recognition expert. Uh, this is a class that you have to go through. It's pretty extensive, to be honest with you. Uh, you have to attend the class and complete that, and then you have to go out of state to be tested to make sure you've, apprehend, you've, you've learned what you've done, then come back in state and also do it for another period of time here before you're actually certified as a drug recognition expert. I'm sorry. They have the indicators that they, they teach them, and they take written tests and actual uh, exam tests. 
that they do and doing the stop and the task and see how they do them and things. Uh, it's a pre-developed course that they actually go through. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. In the back, Dr. Towers. Hey, yeah, I'm Dr. Towers. I run uh, probably one of the largest, if not maybe the largest uh, program for taking care of pregnant women who have substance use disorder. Um, and what I've seen along the way here is that this problem was exploded, as we've all talked about, by too many pills of oxycodone on the street along with hydrocodone. We've done a good job of shrinking those down, but the number one diverted drug on the street now is buprenorphine. And if we don't get the pills off the street, we're not going to get this fixed. Um, probably 95% of the patients who come in for me that are pregnant and addicted are getting buprenorphine off the street. And, and what I notice is that we have 32 providers of buprenorphine in East Tennessee, and only two of them take TenCare. The other 30 only take cash because they don't get reimbursed enough by TenCare to, to take the money. And so what happens is the woman comes in and says, you know, I'm, I need, you know, 30 pills of 80, you know, eight milligram pills, and it's $500 cash. Well, how much is 60 pills? It's $900 cash. She figures out a way to get the $900. Unfortunately, being a female, it's a prostitution or it may be theft, but she gets her 900 bucks, then she comes back into the place and buys the next 60 pills. She sells the 30 pills on the street because they're $37.50 a pill to get enough to buy her next level. The only way we're going to fix this is we have to prevent the diversion of Subutex and buprenorphine. And, and so somehow the state needs to be able to push forward that this is covered by 10 care, so you can you must take the 10 care price. And if you're uninsured, you can only charge the price that a 10 care price would be, which is about 60 bucks, not 900 bucks. Second problem is I, I do drug screens on all my patients, and method and methamphetamines has gone up tenfold in the last 12 months. Their drugs are not their drug screens are negative for everything but methamphetamine. So I, I realize it's coming in from south of the border, but that's our next biggest problem. But my two biggest problems are Subutex, methamphetamines. That's that's ninety five percent of the problem, and I'm going to see over five hundred pregnant women just this year uh, with the problem. But what I do different is I work on detoxing them. But my recommendation for this to get back to the state, we got to prevent the diversion of Subutex because we're not if we don't get the pills off the street, we're not going to fix this. Comments. Thank you, Dr. Towers. Uh, was there? Did you have a question? Right. Um. Mm -hmm. Any any thoughts about uh, buprenorphine diversion? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about that. That's been uh, a topic that's been up discussion in multiple. Uh, task force that I've been involved with. Um, and just so you know, in, in the TDLC prisons, the, uh, the highest drug screens are, you know, Suboxone and, and, and uh, methamphetamines. Uh, so we're seeing the, pretty much the same thing. Um, and I know, you know, previously we worked with uh, Dr. Lloyd and then also in speaking and working with Department of Health Substance Use. Um, that's something that we want to look at because as we start to expand and look at using MAT, we want to make sure that we have providers that are approved, providers that have to, you know, be governed and, and strictly monitored. So I think that's the direction that we're going to be going, and I think that's the direction we need to go uh, if, if, it, if it's going to be effective. Otherwise, we're just going to be contributing to a, a bigger problem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the requirements to be a uh, certified prescriber for buprenorphine uh, for tin care um, are many, or, there, or I guess there are several. Um, and they include taking insurance and minimizing the co-prescribing of benzodiazepines and, and um, uh, you know, having counseling on site and things of that nature. And as, as we get more people into that group of trusted providers uh, that are then also frequently trained up even better uh, through this network, uh, we're going to do better, I think, with uh, buprenorphine prescribing over time and, and it's, it, but it's a real challenge, right? Because I mean, there's a national level push for more and more and more uh, MAT. And uh, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. And it's, it's something that uh, we have to work uh, uh, out, you know, this tension in the middle between these two, these two uh, issues because MAT does save lives. And it also creates this very negative downstream consequence uh, with NAS. And, 
or dominate this uh, panel because they're so so talented here. Um, the, there's a recent study it was published last week um, by uh, Stephen Patrick's group in, at Vandy that indicates that there is significant interaction with um, MAT if uh, benzos are co-prescribed. So for for neonatal absence syndrome as an as an outcome is Dr. Patrick here? I think he was scheduled to be here. I haven't seen him. So um, anyway, there's some good work being being done at Vandy relative to this topic, and um, and we got to get this benzo and uh, buprenorphine um, uh, co-prescribing under control. So uh, other thoughts, other questions. Last question. Right in the middle. Oh, right here. As a ropes coordinator for the state of Tennessee, I am in charge of supplying naloxone and Narcan for our law enforcement agencies. And I've run across several that are a little apprehensive about it. Is there any plans to make it statewide that it would be mandatory for our all agencies to carry? That, that what would be mandatory? Narcan. Narcan, okay. I'm not aware of any that would be mandatory requirements. I don't understand why an agency wouldn't want it at this day and time with, with what we're seeing. Um, well, I, I can tell you what I've heard is some of the things they're concerned about is liability. Uh, are you a doctor if you enter, if you start to administer Narcan? A lot of them uh, have the idea that you're not a medical physician there, so you shouldn't be giving any kind of anything to any individual because of the liability of it. And a lot of your rural areas and some of the other counties are concerned about the liability of that. I think um, I think most. Um Liability uh, is obviated by you know someone coming Not back, dying. but, but uh, being being revived, and so there's uh, there's a major push to train more people and tr train more trainers to use Narcan, including those that uh, that Sarah Melton uh, at, at ETSU has been spearheading uh, for a number of years. Um, we train forty five thousand people at this point um, to use Narcan, Steve. Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doctor Smythe, you have a question. PA being prior authorization, yeah. So there, there. That's another. That's another administrative constraint uh, that that is uh, basically adding costs. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. Thank you, Dr. Smy. All right. Uh, I think we're I think we're done. I would like to thank this uh, incredibly talented uh, and and committed panel for for being here today. Thank you so much for your time.